How's it hanging folks, Mr. Holton here, and today I've made a list of 5 things that people in general want to see in God of War Ragnarok, me included. Now have in mind that I'm just going by what I've seen myself, so if I've missed something important, let me know in the comment section. Also, there is no guarantee that we'll see all of these things, so don't lose your mind if one or two things don't come true. Albeit, it would be pretty strange if some of these things don't happen. We also know that God of Our Ragnarok is the final game set in Scandinavia, so some of these are pretty much bound to happen. Alright, let's just dive right in, and let's start with a banger. The Thor vs Jormungandr fight. Wait, you thought I'd start off with the dad of boy team against the God of Thunder? Here's the thing, we know that Kratos and Atreus will face off against Thor, but let's not forget about Kratos' grandson, snaky boy Jormungandr. We know both from the real Norse myth and from the God of War mythos itself that the World Serpent will face off against Thor, and according to Mimir, their fight is so cataclysmic that it shakes the foundation of the World Tree, Yggdrasil. Mimir, what else did the Serpent tell you when you spoke? Kinda sounded important. I'm sure it's nothing, he just said the boy seemed familiar to him. Me? That's impossible. Don't I quite agree, unless perhaps he refers to something yet to be. It is said that when Jormungandr and Thor battle at Ragnarok, their clash so violently shakes the Tree of Life that it splinters, casting the serpent backward through time, even before his own birth. What? That is madness. Well, I did say not to concern yourself. So, according to Mimir, their battle is so violent that it splinters reality and sends Jormungandr back in time, before he was even born. Now this is something that I personally want to see. God of War has always been a series that's really good at showing off scale, so seeing a battle of this caliber would be magnificent, to say the least. And while we're on the topic of Jormungandr, one thing that's bound to happen is us seeing the birth of Loki's children. That being Sneaky Boy himself, his brother Fenrir, and lastly, their lovely sister Hel. Or maybe not a traditional type of birth, because that would just be... Yeah, no, scratch that. That's why I think that the birth of the three children of Loki is gonna be more of a summoning kind. Like having Loki summoning them as constructs and then we have Angerboda giving them life. That's actually more realistic in my mind. Think back to when Mimir's head was given life by Freya. So it would be some form of giant magic, I would presume. Anyway, no matter how they're born, we're definitely going to see them all grown up in the end, too, since, you know, it's all about Ragnarok and the death of the Nordic gods. Two of the children of Loki are even the direct causes of death for both Thor and Odin, namely Fenris, or Fenrir, and Jormungandr. So they're both incredibly important to the story, and we already know as much for Jormungandr. Well, unless Eric and the team does some huge twist with Fenris that we just can't really imagine right now. And then we have some unanswered questions from the first game. Like, who the hell blew the horn? Somebody just called the serpent. Now I know there's a slew of theories out there that tries to answer this very thing, and most of them are actually pretty good. There's the theory that it may have been Tyr, guiding Kratos and Atreus while hiding from Odin. Another is that it's actually Atreus or Kratos themselves who have journeyed back in time in order to make sure that the story progresses as it should. Maybe it was the lovely Angerboda, Loki's future mistress who, just like Faye, who was Atreus' mother, has prophetic powers and she directly intervened when it was needed. Or maybe it was just Baldur who was looking for Kratos and Atreus. But I gotta admit, why would Jormungandr listen to an Aesir god? Maybe Snakey Boy just moved because someone blew the horn and he didn't think more of it. In any way, me and many others are hoping for an answer to this because this question has been plaguing me since the first game. As we move on, one thing that I'd especially want to see is some greater detail into the travels of Tyr, as we know that he traveled to other realms, including Greece, Egypt, and Asia. Wouldn't it just be absolutely insane to get a glimpse of other pantheons out there? We've already seen bits and pieces of the Egyptian realm. One is a teaser that Cory and the team made before they decided on the Scandinavian setting. He wasn't even going to be his kid. Like, I think the first pitch I gave him was 
that we wouldn't even know what was happening. So it was like Kratos walking through the desert, because we were, in my mind, still doing Egypt initially. Uh, wind and sand blowing all over the place as he's kind of crawling through. And then kind of stands up and crests over a dune and checks out this really fantastic, like, this ancient city. And then he kind of turns around and then says, all right, follow me. And then we kind of reveal that there's uh, a kid there. <laughs> we have a long journey ahead. Here we can see the start of a possible Egyptian setting, and then we get to see some more in the Fallen God comic. There's also the possible connection between Tyr and Durlin the Dwarf that we see right here. This theory, courtesy of Captain Kuba and Mike Hu, is based on the fact that Durlin looks to have all kinds of artifacts from other parts of the world. One such artifact is this thing right here, which looks kind of Mayan or Aztec in design. This leads into the possibility of maybe Durlin being the captain of Tyr's ship, as Tyr is seen on this tapestry right here to have arrived in Greece on a boat. If anything, seeing some of Tyr's and Durlin's backstory could actually be a great tie-in and lead into the next setting for God of War. Okay, so let's talk about this final point here, which is about Surt. Which is how you say it here. <laughs> Surt, if we're gonna be grammatically correct, is the king of the fire giants who reside in Muspelheim. He's also the second primordial giant that existed before time in the Norse realms. You can even visit Muspelheim in God of War 2018 and fight your way up a challenge ladder for some juicy rewards. We see Surter's sword sticking out from the ground, and we're told in the game that Surter never rests, and he hones his skills every day in preparation for Ragnarok where he'll then proceed to rip his giant sword from the ground and move to burn Asgard to dust. In the Norse mythos, Surtur bathes Asgard in flames but is killed by Thor and Odin working as a team. So, will we see the same thing happening here then? Well, it seems so. Mimir says as much while you're boating around in the last game. Is there a story for the giant with the flaming sword? Surt the Brave? Of course. We've spoken so much of frost giants. It's about time we instead met the most fiery giant of all. Back when Ymir first emerged from Ginungagop, it was Surt who followed next. He came from Muspelheim, the Fire Realm, bringing heat to the young cosmos, conjuring the sun from his primordial flame. But let's come back to that flaming sword, shall we? Surt the Brave forged his sword of flame for one purpose alone to burn down Asgard when Ragnarok comes at last. His destiny is to fall at the hands of Thor and Odin, but in so doing, strike the blow that leaves their realm in ash and ruin. And from that destruction, the world can be born anew. Surtur is very much prepared to die while fighting Thor and Odin, but he will destroy Asgard at the same time. But you know, this is Santa Monica Studios. We're probably going to see some gigantic twist here, because who would not like to have a mind-blowing fight against someone that might be the size of Kronos? Except, if we're going by what Mimir is saying, then Surtur will be an ally to us and not an enemy. Atreus is a giant, and Kratos is not a fan of either Odin or Thor. So why would Surtur fight against either Atreus or Kratos? Doesn't make sense. Anyway, these are just some of the things that I've seen a lot of you guys point out that you want to see in God of War Ragnarok. Alright guys, before I end the video, I just gotta tell you that if you want to access the Discord, you just have to become a member or a Patreon. And I've done this to make sure that we don't get any troll accounts or we don't get any bot accounts attacking the Discord server and to, of course to make sure that everybody behaves that actually joins. So, that's that. Become a member of the Ensven Squad today. And as always, have a great day, guys. Mr. Holton, signing out.